I just want to let everybody know that we are so, so grateful to have them here today. And thank you all for tuning in. Uh, this webinar is going to be a really, really powerful conversation. Brian and I want to keep it casual and fun. So if there are any questions or anything that comes up throughout, feel free to either chat them and I can make sure that Brian sees it and also make sure that you know that you can unmute yourself, I believe, at any time. So if there's a question that you'd rather just kind of shout out, that's totally awesome too. Um, this webinar is really the information that is just the breakdown of what a happy and healthy relationship with fitness looks like. And I know a lot of us here on the call are familiar with the fitness realm, and that is awesome. But there is also a ton of stuff that Brian's going to dive into that kind of goes unseen and isn't as understood as something that might be a concern point or just might be something that's adding extra unnecessary stress or pressure to your life. So this doesn't have to do with any kind of eating disorder related things. This is truly just a happy relationship with movement and body, and we are so excited to bring this to you. Brian is a guru of all things movement, so we're so, so excited to have him back. Thank you, Brian, for being here. And Thank I will, absolutely, you're awesome. You're our favorite. <laughs> and we will pass the baton to you and go ahead and dive in. Well, thanks. And that's a really tough introduction to live up to. So I hope <laughs> these uh, next few minutes are, are worthwhile for everybody, um, but I'll try my best to, to fulfill everything that Abby said. And I think, you know, what you said, Abby, it, you hit the nail right on the head. Uh, when we look at exercise and what does a healthy rela relationship with exercise look like, we all have our background in the fitness industry and, and knowledge of fitness and exercise science principles, and those are vitally important. Um, the only thing I can really say about it is they are essential pieces of the puzzle, but they're not the complete puzzle. Mm -hmm. so what we're going to look at today is the other side of that. What are the pieces of the puzzle that we tend to overlook because, quite frankly, they're easy to overlook? And I think the fitness industry or the exercise science field as a whole, by and large, has overlooked these factors. So that's what we're going to um, start with. What does this all look like? I've got a little activity to play with that on the first um, little bullet point here in the outline. Then we'll get into defining some ideas about exercise and eating pathology. They kind of go hand in hand a little bit. Um, and how do we differentiate risks and understand all of these different things together? Um, when we're suspecting there is a problem with exercise or eating pathology, how can we do that? There are some screening measures that are available. And then finally, we'll wrap it up with a Q&A. But I don't want that Q&A to be only at the end. I want you guys to jump in if you have questions or anything like that. That's why I put Q&A slash discussion. I'd rather have the end be more of a big discussion and we can uh, interject with questions uh, whenever you want. So uh, feel free to interrupt me. Okay. So let's play a game. Um, you guys remember these little games that were in all the magazines, like in the pediatrician's office and dentist office and stuff like that, where you had to find the differences in each of the picture. Um, really fun. Still do them now, I will admit. Um, they're really fun. Uh, I've got some here, uh, two pictures, and I apologize because of the limitations of a screen. It'll have to be on two slides, so you might have to use your memory a little bit here. But let's look and see if we can find the differences uh, in what we can see anyway from pictures of exercise, what's an unhealthy versus a healthy relationship. So first I'll show you the healthy relationship. So this is what a healthy relationship with exercise looks like. So we see a lot of people, all different sizes, shapes, ages, everything. Like everybody can exercise, right? I mean, that's kind of a universal thing. Um, so I'll give you guys a second to burn this one into your memory banks. All right, now what differences do you see here for an unhealthy relationship with exercise? I like the face that you're making right now, Abby, because you're absolutely right. It's kind of a trick question, but not really. Um, obviously, they were the same pictures. And just as a side note, really interesting when you go to Google Images looking for pictures and you type in, you know, kind of adjectives that would describe um, different depictions of exercise. Um, I think 
that's really the basis for much of the problems that we have with this is the sociocultural connotation that we have around exercise. Um, I mean, we see that now with the current uh, COVID um, crisis, the pandemic that we're under, and a lot of the pathology that's out there in terms of um, memes and jokes and uh, messaging about exercise during quarantine and how that relates to health overall, specifically weight and eating habits and things like that. And this is a big convoluted mess when you really think about it from a societal perspective. This is something that I think we all struggle with. So the point to this little activity is that it's really about more than that. It's not about looking at somebody and seeing their behavior and saying, oh, see, look at, they're, they're going too fast, they're exercising too much, they're doing too much, like all these adjectives, right? Um, behavior is a big part of the story, but as we said at the get-go, behavior is only one part of the story. And where we're at right now is understanding that there are other pieces that have a lot of importance in, that, in telling that story. So behavior is a good primer to kind of cue you into something that may be a problem, and there's the key word is may be a problem or may be an unhealthy relationship with exercise, but it's not the only side of the story. And similarly, look at the physical attributes. We tend to do this all the time. That's not going to tell us anything. There are so many things wrong with that. I mean, I even cringed when I wrote that bullet point because that is just one of the worst things. And it's something that I'm, I'm really sensitive to with the work that I do, both at Osana and uh, throughout my career, and even just personally. Uh, I'm sure many people on this uh, webinar were athletes or are athletes and I mean, can think back to, you know, being recruited out of high school and things like that for college sports and how much of it is about not what you do, but the physical attributes that your body has, especially as you're developing and it just gets into a, a, a complete um, a blender of, of things that make no sense. Um, so try to stay away from that. Um, by just looking and ascribing um, some semblance of health or unhealthy status based on a, a physical attribute, because um, there's so much more than what meets the eye, quite literally, in this case. Where we're at right now is to truly define how to distinguish a healthy from an unhealthy ex uh, relationship of exercise, you really have to look at the psychological factors. Um, this is very difficult, obviously. Uh, I think even just the word psychology brings up a lot of connotation for many, many people. Um, this isn't lie on the couch and tell me about your dreams and your mom type of psychology. Psychology just means the study of human behavior. And when you think about it, anybody who's working in exercise, you're a psychologist because that's a, that's a behavior. You have to understand a lot of things that go into that behavior. What are the motives? Are these people, your clients, the people that you work with, going to adhere to an exercise routine? Are they even going to work with you? Or are they going to be a little bit more oppositional and try to work against you and do it their way? What about competitiveness? These are all factors that are vitally important with understanding the big picture perspective of what exercise is about. So to really take this holistic viewpoint, which is really what we all strive for, I think, and understand that exercise is a key thing in this relationship about health and well-being, how is it that it fixes with the other areas of health and well-being? And the thing I kind of think about when I think about this is we all love exercise, we all love sport, we all love being active. Uh, we all have a passion for it. And passion can be good, obviously, but it can also be a little bit bad sometimes too, depending on what way it goes. It's actually an emerging area of exercise pathology research. Um, some of my friends and colleagues in this area, I work a lot in the behavioral addiction area on exercise addiction. And actually one of my good friends and colleagues um, uh, that I published with just published a paper this week on looking at different facets of passion and how it relates to exercise addiction. But ultimately what we think of when we think of this is we all understand that exercise is the thing and, and we're right. I don't wanna, you know, I mean, obviously I'm biased and I feel like I'm amongst, um, you know, similar minded people right now, so I can say that. But really, if you kind of step back and look at the bigger picture perspective, exercise really is just the straw that stirs the drink. And what I mean by that is it's the thing that kickstarts the physiology. It's what allows our body to work the way our body was intended to work, the way our body is built to work. 
It's ultimately the way that our body learns to be and work with itself instead of against itself. It helps to maximize and efficiently uh, use all of the substrate, all of the fuel that's coming in, help to use all of even waste product of other metabolism. We can actually find ways that we can be more efficient with that. Exercise ultimately makes us become extremely metabolically and physiologically efficient. It also translates into the mental well-being as well. We know now there's more and more evidence that the exercise level that you have, I mean, you get even how muscle mass corresponds to brain development and neurological function. I mean, it really fascinating stuff that, you know, 20 years ago we thought was completely nonsense, but now we have solid evidence for it. Um, so the world of understanding in this area is clearly coming down on looking at psychological factors. Um, my training is in exercise and sports psychology, and it always reminds me of looking at a lot of studies of elite level athletes. And if it were just about training more and being stronger, everybody could be an elite level athlete. But when you really distinguish the truly elite versus the just really, really good or really, really strong or really, really fast type athlete, the difference lies in the psychological factors. How are they able to perceive things? How are they able to process things? Um, I'm not a big fan because I grew up a Celtics fan, but I remember seeing a, Le a commercial that LeBron James has for a, a particular product where he talks about that, where the best athletes are the ones that train their mind in addition to training their body. So we really are seeing this kind of sea change in understanding that we have to consider the psychological part. And that's not at all what a lot of the connotations of that word psychological may imply. So really important um, thing to kind of tease apart right here. Um, with this, understand also that just this notion of the question that we're contemplating during this webinar, that what it does a healthy relationship look like is not to imply that unhealthy is the polar opposite. Everything exists in shades of gray. Um, so we have to think of this more as a dichotomy, I'm sorry, as a continuum and not a dichotomy. In fact, when we think of it that way, we can find more grace and acceptance about working with our body and how we can make our body more efficient, in addition to making our mind correspond to that physiological process. So when we can get that synergy of the two, that's truly what a healthy relationship of exercise looks like. How do we actually do that? That's really the million dollar question. Um, that's really what we're working on, obviously at Alsana and many other places as well. How do we balance the two to get to the person to where they want to be in terms of their outcome goals that they're looking at as uh, a motivation for exercise, really. And all of this comes together, like I said, in a nice continuum model. So we can look at this by defining levels of who is at risk for having an unhealthy relationship with exercise. And the short answer is all of us. Um, I don't know if anybody has seen this before, but there's this continual model of eating disorders. And I know this talk isn't specifically about eating disorders, but I like this model here because it really does show the full scope of what we're talking about. And I even kind of went back and forth as I was pulling this together and, and building this presentation, where when I talk about this, especially you know when I've given presentations that have included this slide before, I'll talk about everything over here on the left-hand side, the body acceptance, normal eating habits, healthy weight, age, um, body type, et cetera. I, I usually say those are unicorns. Um, so I had a little picture of like a GIF of a unicorn there, but I was like, yeah, maybe I should take that out. But I'll, I'll mention it now because that's rare, um, obviously. Many people strive for that and many people might outwardly appear to be that, but what's happening with all of those other factors that we can't see? What are the other things that are going into that? And that's really where the nuance really can tell the story. Rather, what we see is, let's be honest, a lot of people to get to that outward semblance of this kind of unicorn ideal, if you will, on the left, cut corners a little bit. You know, we all want the thing that's the best, the way that we can get to our goals quickest, the, you know, outperform yesterday sort of mentality that exists around uh, fitness and exercise. And 
that can be good, but it can also overreach. And I use that word intentionally because that's really the, the training oriented word that we look at with it. You know, th this notion of if some is good, more is better. And that is only true to an extent, obviously. Some is good, more can be better, but then continue to do that. And you're going to quite literally burn out is what the, the terminology is called. And actually what we see with that, um, recent research, in fact, fMRI research, um, not even six months old at this point, um, has conclusively shown that when we induce that state of burnout to try to get to these kind of ideals on the left, it actually activates the same exact areas of the brain that are responsible for controlling an eating disorder. So all of these things are actually controlled by the exact same centers in the brain. So we have to be really careful with it. It actually provides some strong physiological and mechanistic evidence for how and why, if we're in this kind of red box that's in the middle here, this disordered eating box, and you can see excessive exercise uh, in that box, other things that are related to unhealthy um, forms of exercise, steroid use, um, I don't have drug use in here, but we should, um, any of these striving for perfection, weight and shape preoccupation, things like that, to a certain degree, some of that can be facilitative. Obviously, I'm not endorsing any of that. For some people, it has a bit of a motivational pull, but certainly it's a motivational pull that exists on a very, very slippery, greased up, you know, slope that's at a high angle. Um, in other words, the chances are overwhelming that if those are motivations, they're not gonna end well. Um, Mother Nature and Father Time are undefeated. And these things typically will tilt back down towards the right-hand side of the ledger here, which is a diagnosable uh, disorder. I have um, the kind of traditional uh, main eating disorder categories here or diagnoses here, anorexia, bulimia, and binge eating disorder. But we could also add on there things like exercise addiction, compulsive exercise, body dysmorphia, muscle dysmorphia, and a variety of other things as well. So when we look at this, this is just kind of a primer, um, like I said in the outline, of how all of these things fit together. The reality of it is, is we all live somewhere in, or most of us, I should say, live somewhere in that red box. And that's okay to a point. The key is making sure we don't tilt that red box to the right. We want to keep that red box moving as much to the left as possible and find grace in the fact that there doesn't have to be a perfectionistic ideal. This is why on the previous, uh, or two slides ago, I said, don't think of this as a dichotomy. Think of it as a continuum. We have to have that acceptance that everything exists in various shades of gray, and that is good. That is human nature. So I think just having that orientation is a good stepping stone towards finding some um, semblance of what is a healthy relationship with exercise versus what isn't. And we'll get more into what that means in a second. There's a few um, really fun facts, though, uh, stats to include about this to kind of illustrate this point. Uh, most of the research in this area has been done in um, college age women, high school age women. This is a huge risk area or risk time in uh, human development and lifespan for the development of eating disorders. And as you can see, you know, the simple majority of uh, individuals within this age range engage in some form of what we would consider eating disordered behavior. And I wanna be clear on this. This doesn't mean that all of these people have an eating disorder. It does mean that they're at an increased risk. What it means is that they're somewhere in that red box sliding towards the right of that continuum. What we also know is when you engage in these things, again, mother nature, father time, undefeated, this does catch up to you. You know, it's not uncommon to have to skip a meal or that you eat fewer calories, or maybe, you know, you go a day without eating carbs or, or something like that. That tends to happen a lot, whether it be from cultural or religious preferences, whether it be um, just from randomness that happens, time constraints and things like that. It doesn't automatically influence an eating disorder. Rather, what matters is what's that psychological factor that's motivating that behavior. And that's really where we can see the difference in is that behavior healthy or unhealthy. Quite frankly, our bodies are built to go through periods of excess and periods of deficiency. We're not built for the modern society that we live in with access to fitness centers and food options and all of these other modern amenities that we have. The irony of this is we're all probably sitting down right now as we 
engage in this uh, webinar. It's not the way our bodies are built. Rather, we're built as animals that have to go out and find sources of energy, sources of fuel. We have to s expend a little bit of fuel to get more fuel, things like that. So any of these things are basically just ways that we try to manipulate that ledger. Um, and you can see a lot of them can be really detrimental. And some of them you know, influence the detrimental aspect of that ledger faster than others, particularly when you get down to the bottom, uh, fasting, laxative use, diuretics, vomiting, things like that. So we really want to be careful with all of this. This is a newer study, um, more recent than the one that I just showed, that shows this and breaks it down um, uh, by uh, Hispanic or non-Hispanic women. And you can see the rates are relatively similar. So I wanted to just give a couple um, kind of um, uh, sources of data here to show that Basically, it doesn't matter what the exact number is. This is something that uh, a lot of people get hung up on. And actually, that would be a warning sign that maybe this is getting a little bit wonky and maybe into the unhealthy ranges when you start arguing over a couple percentage points. Um, it's not about that. It's about looking at the bigger picture. And more importantly, how do these things all interact together? And that's really the key with all of this. It's finding the balance of a variety of different things. It's, it's like trying to juggle hundreds, if not thousands of balls all in the air at the same time while you're standing on a balance and maybe there's an earthquake going on too. Um, so it's really, really interesting. If we look at this in terms of what's out there in the community, um, you'd be surprised. Uh, this kind of unhealthy relationship with exercise and uh, um, eating behaviors is more prevalent than you may think. Um, it is something that uh, is a problem. What these numbers show is a classic study in understanding the prevalence of problems with unhealthy relationships, both with exercise and eating, uh, but a, a variety of different um, kind of weight control and body control type um, behaviors. But if we were to take 100,000 young women, which is a primary risk factor, or risk group, I should say here. And they're just spread out throughout the community. So you just out on the street, you, out, you can somehow get a diagnosis or information on 100,000 young women. You'd expect about 1,500 of them to have uh, bulimia nervosa and about 370 of them to have uh, anorexia. The other reason that I put this in is for the next two parts that I'll talk about, the primary care and the mental health care, to really emphasize the point that I made at the beginning. You can't just look at somebody and know this. You can't just look at somebody and diagnose this. So testament to that, of these roughly 400 and 1,500 people here with either anorexia nervosa or bulimia nervosa that are just kind of out and about uh, in the real world, you would expect their primary care physician to identify this. I mean, these are obviously um, disorders with pretty severe consequences up to and including death. In fact, eating disorders have the highest mortality rate of any psychiatric illness. Um, that's a really dramatic um, number when you think about that, a really dramatic fact when you think about that. I mean, normally people think about things like depression or maybe uh, substance use or personality disorders. Um, substance use is actually catching up, and there's a couple studies that say it's either right on level with eating disorders or maybe even slightly above at this point. But either way, it, it, it's a very severe, severe thing. So you'd expect a doctor to catch that. And by and large, doctors even do a terrible job in catching this. So this is definitely a case to illustrate that when it comes to looking at unhealthy either exercise or eating patterns, you know, you can't judge a book by its cover. And even trained professionals can't judge a book by its cover at this point. Um, so they're only catching, you know, about 160 out of the 370 individuals with anorexia and about 170 out of the 1,500 individuals with bulimia. What's even worse with that, though, is how many of them are referring on to getting the help that they need. You know, a, a good uh, chunk of that 160 is actually being referred on to for mental health care, so 127 on average, but over here, 87 out of the 170. So put all of these numbers in perspective. Out of every 100,000 young women, we can expect about 370 of them have anorexia only 127 of them are actually being referred on to for help for that. Out of 1,500 women 
with bulimia, only 87 are being referred on to for help. So the point to this is obviously I realize it's a little heavy on eating disorders and I apologize if it's kind of veering that way, but it really does illustrate that these are the things that are the psychological factors that are often motivating an unhealthy relationship with exercise. In fact, in the behavioral addiction community, there's great debate about can somebody have an exercise addiction without actually having an eating disorder. Um, personally, if you were to ask me, I have met people that have strictly an exercise addiction. Um, they are very rare though. I do believe, uh, and I think the data would back me up on this, that that prevalence is much, much lower. By and large, the overwhelming number of people that struggle with an unhealthy relationship with exercise are gonna be represented on this screen right here. Um, and what this screen really does emphasize is we can't just pick them out of a crowd and say, we got it, even though we think we can sometimes. So it's a really tough thing to, to look at. And the way that it relates all together here is a lot of the psychological part, like I've talked about uh, previously. When we think about it, what drives this is kind of black and white or perfectionistic type thinking. You know, uh, that really fuels an eating disorder, but it also fuels athletic performance. When we think about the externalization that happens with athletic performance, whether that be in a competitive sense or whether it be in a fitness sense, uh, just, you know, I'm going to the gym sort of idea. There's a lot of this kind of like, I have to, I should, I must, I have to beat yesterday. If my opponent's resting, then I'm losing. Or if I'm resting, my opponent's winning. And you know the, the classic, no pain, no gain. Um, I hope all of us understand how detrimental those things can be for even an average individual. If you throw on a, an increased risk factor, um, particularly people that are in that red box on that continuum that I showed earlier, if they're a little bit more to the right, then this really, really muddies the water. What it does is it creates an internal voice that's really an external voice. And we see this happen a lot in individuals with eating disorders, actually. We have this kind of voice. It's almost like the old um, Bugs Bunny cartoons where you have the devil and the angel on the shoulder. And one, one is motivating to do something and the other one's motivating to do the other. Well, you have this voice that resides within you. So it feels very much tied to who you are. And it's really pushing into a more and more unhealthy way and it chips away slowly. So the reason that it is problematic is that it develops over time and you don't really see that kind of stark contrast from A to B. Instead, it's kind of like, I don't know how I got here, but I'm gonna keep going here because it just feels right because that's become so internalized. Um, in psychology, we call this egocentric. It's really intertwined with the individual sense of being even though it's come from somewhere else. And in this case, where it's coming from are different pathological sociocultural messages like we talked about at the beginning. It's coming from genetic abnormalities and differences, physiological abnormalities that define um, uh, differences in unhealthy relationships with exercise. We know that this exists in eating disorders. We have solid evidence of this. And like I said a minute ago, we're actually getting more and more evidence that this exists in exercise as well. Um, particularly in exercise addiction and overreaching and burning out with exercise and how that triggers. And ultimately what we find out kind of to the point that I made about the debate within the behavioral addictions community is this may be one in the same. There's very few individuals that have uh, an exercise addiction without an eating disorder. So really interesting how all of these things share such core concepts that can really define when uh, and a relationship with exercise is becoming unhealthy. So the important thing to kind of summarize this is this perfectionism that we're talking about. What we say is that it mediates exercise and eating disorder relationship. In other words, it's the thing that can help you slide over to the right on that continuum of disordered eating that I talked about before. We need things to slide over to the left of that. Um, I can say, because I, I've seen the evidence and other groups around the world have also shown this evidence, that when we intervene on these psychological aspects, that's how you slide over to the left of that healthy side of the ledger with a healthy relationship with exercise. If left unabated, you will slide more to the right. Again, Mother Nature, Father Time are undefeated. Uh, so it's, it's really interesting. The problem with exercise is it's a very razor thin edge between this notion of perfectionism and really what we should be going after, which is excellence. 
Eating disorders strive for perfectionism, and that can be very socially acceptable. It can really convolute that notion of what is healthy versus unhealthy in terms of relationship with exercise and overall well-being. But if we're really trying to just maximize the self, again, as I talked about in terms of the exercise physiology, physiology of this, be more efficient with the machinery that we have with our body and work with our body instead of against our body, that squarely lies in the realm of excellence. So we want to be careful with this. To use a sport analogy, uh, in general, we can get mired down in the win-loss. That's more about perfectionism. But if we're mired down more in the, hey, I gave it my best, and you know, so what? I came up short. I did my best. That's what I got. That's more on the excellence side. It's not really the thing that is culturally endorsed, to be quite honest. We have um, a very convoluted, uh, almost um, gladiator type mentality around outcomes based on wins and losses. But really what we know is to maximize p potential um, that can help us get to those wins and losses. So we don't wanna kind of shoot ourselves in the foot and get in our own way here. So. The key here is differentiating perfectionism versus excellence is a key consideration in changing what we call the functional relationship of exercise in this notion of what is healthy versus unhealthy. And again, using eating disorders as the kind of moniker of that because it really does exist along that continuum. And most of the knowledge base about this has come from that field. This is a um, very good slide that I've uh, put together that you can use as a tool to help to define when a relationship with exercise is veering from unhealthy, uh, I'm sorry, from healthy to unhealthy. And it's by working with clients um, that you have in understanding is their motivation more in the perfectionism column or the excellence column. And you can see there's a lot of different things in here, whether it's about competitiveness, self-esteem, um, that's a real big one. Uh, Self-identity is another big one. Um, so we see that manifest in here about uh, the kind of uh, self-talk that we have and how the uh, engagement in exercise um, results in either demoralizing or motivating you or, or things like that, or your client, I should say. Um, is it rooted in an irrational belief or a rational belief in reality? Unfortunately, what we see so often is the perversion of exercise science with kind of irrational shortcuts that may work temporarily but you're, they're designed for physiological failure, and I'm not implicating any one workout routine or program, so please do not read into the words that I'm saying. Um, quite frankly, I don't wanna be sued here, so I am not even thinking about any program, but we all like to cut corners. We all like to try to maximize and get the best when we all know that the simple advice of slow and steady wins the race tends to be physiologically how our bodies are built and how we can actually maximize our own potential. So how do we differentiate those irrational beliefs, which are really kind of fantasy versus the reality of how we can actually do things over the long haul? So again, looking at that temporal order of this is very important as well. So again, this is something that you can uh, take, uh, take a screenshot, write it down, or um, if you want, I can send you a copy um, and, and you'll be um, all set. So the key differences in exercise then are that exercise in individuals with eating pathology, eating disorders, or even exercise pathology, um, it's not the same as even uh, kind of goal-oriented forms of training, if we're gonna use a fitness uh, or an exercise science term here. Behaviorally, it may seem the same, but that motivation or that drive is really what differentiates this. This is where we can identify the difference. So again, those psychological factors are the key for all of this. So when we think about this, remember that there's a wide breadth of factors that influence exercise in eating disorders or in exercise pathology or in any other form of unhealthy relationships among exercise and uh, the holistic self. It's more than just an excessive behavior. Quite frankly, some people can do more behavior of exercise that to others may seem excessive, but it's a matter of working within the individual constraints and not applying the constraints of somebody else onto an individual. It's not uh, applying your own biases or transferring your own beliefs onto that individual. Rather, the key to this is using empathy, having a truly client-centered approach where you're putting that yourself in their shoes to understand the full scope of what's going on, and that's a very difficult thing to, to do. 
What we've found in the research world anyway, and certainly again in the clinical world, is that it's this compulsory quality rather than an excessive quantity of exercise that's a better characterization of exercise that's related to eating disorders. I can also tell you that the same thing has been found in um, exercise pathology in general. Um, exercise addiction, if you want to call it that. I tend to call it exercise pathology because there are a lot of different terms out there that are used that all describe the same singular phenomenon. Um, compulsivity seems to be the one that if you're going to kind of become like a, a, a high school English teacher and, and want to use the exact right word, compulsivity would probably be the one that best describes things because compulsivity has a lot to do with emotional management and this overwhelming desire to continue to do something despite a physical problem or when other areas of your life are suffering. In other words, it really matches that perfectionistic ideal that we talked about a, a few slides ago in the previous couple slides. So really, really interesting um, when we think about that. Um, okay, I'm sorry, I just saw a question come in. So Rachel, awesome, but do you wanna unmute or ask? Keep going or I want to make sure that everybody gets their questions. Yeah, I think I was sharing in the chat that we had been um, messaging and she was really focusing on the fact that this, like you've been saying, isn't weight related. And we just think that that's such an important point to, to double make. And we were chatting about that in the group because it's so so real and so scary regardless of weight. And I think that a lot of people think, oh, my weight's not that low, so I don't have a problem. And that's that's right. not what's going on. So we were chatting about that. Yeah, and it's a, an excellent point. I mean, weight is just a number. Um, it, it's a proxy measure at best, you know. Um, and actually, one thing that I found really fascinating as I was getting more into this and, um, you know, this field is if you look at, you know, weight as that measure, that outcome, that thing that a lot of people are really too focused on, to be quite honest. Um, first off, that in itself is a problem. But also, there's so much more to weight than just that number itself. I mean, there's a lot of other genetic influences, um, just you know, your size, your, your, your own physical constitution, your own gene uh, physiological makeup. Um, some people are just um, you know, uh, in smaller bodies, and that doesn't mean they have an eating disorder. I can think of one of my good friends growing up, and he was just a tiny guy. Um, and, you know, I guess he just must have had fast metabolism or something. I mean, he just always stayed tiny no matter what we ate or what our activity level was or all of these traditional markers that we think. And, you know, even still to this day, you know, decades later, he's still a tiny guy. Um, and then I've got, you know, friends and family members that are just in larger bodies. And no matter what they do, they're in larger bodies. So it, it's way more complicated than just this really ridiculous notion of calories in, calories out that society perpetuates. Uh, it's probably the, the worst health advice that's commonly accepted as general health advice. So um, you make an excellent point. And, um, you know, I'm not a fan of weight. And I, I don't have weight in here, actually, as a thing. Rather, we want to think about things from that, like I was saying before, psychological domain. And if weight is an important proxy for anything in that Kind of continuum of unhealthy to healthy relationship with exercise, what we end up seeing almost um, universally actually, whether we're talking about an eating disorder or whether we're talking about um, an exercise addiction, is when we dive deeper and keep peeling apart the layers of that onion, we find what's at the core are the things that are here on the bottom bullet point. The emotional regulation, affect regulation, Maybe if it's an eating disorder thing, it could be about weight or shape control, or it could be, even if it's a um, kind of uh, exercise addiction thing about looking like an athlete, that ideal of what you think that particular athlete should look like. It's about doing things, exercising, engaging in behavior, even though your body is clearly saying, yo, put the brakes on here, I need a rest. I need, I need to stop here. And if you think about it that way, that's a key one right there. I think if there's one way to summarize, does somebody have an unhealthy relationship with exercise, it would be, can you stop? Can you take a day off? Um, that would be a really big one right there. Um, okay, so um, 
never really stopped. Thank you, uh, Natasha, for this comment, if you don't mind my um, uh, reading the question, but never really stopped to think about uh, motivation behind exercise until recently. It's helped me see how unhealthy my view of exercise was not too long ago. I was uh, such a perfectionist about it. Hearing this is so helpful. Well, thank you very much. And I think you hit the nail right on the head is that part of that is we're never asked to question anything. We're just told to do it. How much of what we know about exercise is from our you know, old school coaching, you know, coaches, phys ed teachers, things like that, where it's like, just shut up and do it, right? You know, just go do it, you know? Um, in, in fact, Nike, just do it, right? Another um, exercise, exercise slogan that, you know, can sell a lot of shoes, but sometimes it can take it a little too far. Um, it should be just go do it, but also listen to your body and see what you can do. Um, get that nice synergy there, because really when we think about it, exercise, as I said earlier, is the straw that stirs the drink, but if you really think about it, exercise isn't what um, does all of these fantastic benefits that we want out of exercise. Rather, it just kickstarts the process. For example, with um, building muscle hypertrophy, exercise actually causes micro tears in your muscle. It's the recovery period after and making sure that there's sufficient time and refueling within that recovery period that actually leads to the hypertrophy. So if we don't have the necessary building blocks and the key ingredient of time, we're going to basically be minimizing the gains that we can get when we are setting out to lift heavy objects in the attempt of hypertrophy. So when we start thinking about it that way, it really moves away from some of those exercise related slogans and um, kind of perfectionistic ideals. So really, really um, interesting. This is a model that I built many years ago um, and validated and it's since been validated by other groups around the world to show how all of these things come together. And when I think of it, we, we tend to easily think of exercise as uh, having a major influence in quality of life. In other words, if we exercise, our quality of life is much better. And when we think about that, the reason why is because exercise affects every aspect of us, every cell in our body, every tangible and intangible thing about us. So social support, social well-being, the friendships that we nurture and, and create and, and you know, cultivate through movement, through exercise, through social ideals. Um, physical well-being is an obvious one when it comes to exercise, but we're learning more and more about the connections with psychological well-being and the physical physiology that underlies all of that. So we know that all of these things work together. So if you were to just look at this and only focus on these benefits of exercise, and I think the comment about overly perfectionistic thinking and not really considering that motivation really exemplifies this, what we're left with then is overlooking how exercise then could become an unhealthy relationship to begin with. And what the research has shown, my research and research from many others around the world, is that if we're to put this, and let's put eating disorders as the marker of a truly unhealthy relationship at the end here, we can circumvent all that good in the middle by having what we call a mediating factor. So exercise addiction or dependence, um, exercise pathology is the word that I've been using through this. In other words, an unhealthy relationship with exercise. So it's really that psychological characteristic, those psychological qualities, that motivational aspect that we've been talking about, if you will, that can uh, circumvent and supersede all of the great benefits of exercise and lead to some severe problems. So this model right here, more than anything, is a validated model that can actually show where and how a relationship of exercise can go from healthy to unhealthy. So I thought it was a, a, an interesting thing to, to put out. Uh, and let's see, it looks like there's some questions coming in. I hope the You Go Girl one wasn't um, directed to me. <laughs> um, so recovery aspects, something I try to remind myself clients during a workout uh, is the importance of rest and recovery. And, and that's just it. Uh, it really is um, about that type of working with your body. And part of working with your body is having that time frame to allow the body to do what it can do, what it needs to do. And the nice thing is, is as we condition ourselves with exercise, that time frame can actually adjust. That time frame can actually change. And that's really where we want to be going. But we have to be honest with that appraisal of that time frame and our physiological ability um, for all of that. So the take home points on here, uh, most people struggle with some form of an unhealthy relationship with eating or exercise behaviors. That does not mean they have an eating disorder. It does not mean they are exercise addicted. It doesn't mean anything to be quite honest because we don't really know what's going on. Um, 
one thing I do want to emphasize, though, is even if all things are equal and they are relatively um, okay at that moment, there's some solid evidence that shows that even a mild dysregulation or unhealthy pattern of exercise over time will actually result in severe physical and psychological harm. And this is interesting. We're gathering more and more mechanistic physiological evidence to show that this is all related. So I think we really need to consider time and a couple of the comments and questions that just came in and that we just discussed really talk about that as well. So the, the question here is really about time. It's not that you do a particular workout or routine or uh, you're excessive or you're not eating. It's does that persist over time? Our bodies are built to handle quite a bit that we can throw at it. But can we allow our body to bounce back? And if we don't allow our body the time to bounce back, that's when the problem is very clear cut uh, and very easy to identify. So the behavior may suggest a problem, but it doesn't diagnose a problem. When we look at this, um, we have to think of the uh, underlying psychological aspect of it. The behavior is just one part of it. It's just how it manifests. It's the thing that can cue us off, but cueing us off is not the end of the story. It's just telling us what's happening. It's kind of like um, going to the movies and seeing the preview and you watch that five minute preview. You didn't see the whole movie. You might have a good idea of what's happening in that movie, but you don't know the whole movie. And there's always a plot twist, right? That's what eating disorders are. They're the ultimate plot twist. Uh, what exercise addiction is, it's the ultimate plot twist. So we can't just look at the trailer and expect that we know the whole movie is really where I'm going with that analogy. Rather, we have to understand why a behavior occurs and how it relates to the pathology. And that's really where you got to dig in deep and do the work. And quite frankly, that's what mental health professionals are there for. So current theory suggests that the etiology, or in other words, the development, the study of the development of these different things, what is the difference between a healthy and an unhealthy relationship? It has more to do with this emotional valence of it. Uh, as much as maybe some of us don't like to admit it, humans are an emotional creature. We have emotional underpinnings. Emotion drives our behavior. Um, we have to understand and appreciate and make peace with that emotion. Because if not, then that's how we can see ourselves sliding along this continuum that we've been working with throughout this presentation. So in other words, it's really the why of all of this. That's why from a purely linguistic standpoint, it's been proposed that the word compulsive is what's best describing a lot of these unhealthy relationships with exercise. So in a couple minutes left here, and I'm just gonna blow through this quick. If you suspect a problem, you're certainly not alone. A uh, very recently published study looked at 140 fitness centers and found that 75% of employees suspect at least some of their clients have either an exercise or an eating disorder problem, but only two thirds of them confronted the client. Half didn't even know what to do, if there were guidelines or anything like that. So this really is kind of leaving everybody out in the lurch. Um, we need better um, understanding of this. And there's not much guidance. The best guidance comes from um, Australia. And basically they just suggest looking at, paying attention to losing a lot of weight rapidly. Obviously this has to do more with trying to control the body as opposed to working with the body, something that we've talked about throughout here. Um, is the attendance getting excessive where it can be manifesting in other areas like weight loss, like, um, well, you'll see a couple more coming in here, other behaviors that are represented in that um, disordered eating box that we talked about before. The first one being, are you doing this even though you're injured or ill? That's always a big cue. If you're continuing to do something when your body's literally saying, hey, we need a break here, that's a, a big red flag, um, that there could be more of an unhealthy relationship here. Uh, is your performance suffering? If we're doing this from a purely performance-oriented or even exercise-oriented, health-oriented aspect, um, there is a bit of a linear path that we expect, but part of that linear path means holding back and having a you know two steps forward, one step back sort of an approach. Uh, I talk about this with our clients actually as it's more of a dance. It's two steps forward, one step back, two steps to the side and twirl, and then eventually you keep moving forward. So you really have to keep patience and uh, the long view in mind with all of this. Busy spells, fainting, clearly a, a sign that something is going on. Uh, becoming unsteady goes hand in hand with dizzy and fainting. Uh, difficulties concentrating can be a big one. 
um, even just emotional problems, anxiety. I was reading a study that came out recently that um, because of COVID, there's so many people that are experiencing more anxiety issues and even having trouble just picking words. So I guess maybe if I'm uh, having trouble finding the right word in this webinar, uh, you guys must be making me anxious. Um, but uh, we, we see this happening quite a bit. And obviously, if anybody's purging um, at, at the fitness center itself, that's always a red sign, a uh, red flag, or a sign that something's wrong. And you know, trust your gut is really the bottom line with this. If you suspect something, you know, lovingly try to talk to somebody, and you know, let them know that you're there for them. Um, this is straight review, and I even felt silly putting this in here because clarity is awesome. So I'm going to just skip right to the bottom here, um, and I'll talk about these, but I want this last thing up on the screen as I talk about this. Clarity is doing such a good job with this, and you really are the pioneers in creating a healthy, supportive environment for how to support somebody to stay on that healthy side of the relationship ledger with exercise. And the way you do that is by creating a holistic and inclusive environment that's focused on health and not on all this other extraneous stuff that, quite frankly, exercise has had a strong relationship with, or at least the fitness industry has had a strong relationship with. Look at these warning signs that we talked about on the previous slide. Um, refer people to specialized help when needed and identify if any of these behaviors are truly inappropriate. And the way that we do that is by considering the full scope of the problem. And that really has to do with the psychological quality, not the behavioral quantity of the behavior itself. And know that you have a role in this, that you can be a supportive member of the recovery process. It is a collaboration. It really does take all hands on deck. But again, I even feel dumb saying this because I'm preaching at the choir here. Clarity is by far leading the, the uh, charge in the fitness world with this. And having a, a, a positive environment like Clarity provides is just something that I'm incredibly thankful for. If you need screening tools for this, um, we do have a couple. And um, ah, yes, uh, we, so we have... Um, a couple of thing, questions about the things that we're talking about right here. So this is a very easy one, just six questions uh, to measure exercise addiction. Um, you can see these six questions here. You measure the, um, or you have the person respond on a scale of one to five, strongly disagree to strongly agree, and then just add up the score. You can see the cutoffs here. If they're above a 24, there's a problem um, brewing. So we definitely want to look at that. That would indicate more of that psychological quality that veers towards an unhealthy relationship with exercise. Um, we also have a compulsive exercise test. This one's a bit more involved. Um, so you can take this. It's here on the screen. Uh, same idea, only you're going from a, um, a zero uh, to five type uh, scale on this and you do have to pay attention to number eight over here and number 12 because those numbers uh, those answers should be reverse scored so in other words if they score if they say a one that's really a four and so on and so forth uh, and this basically shows how exercise may be relating specifically to an eating disorder so something that goes hand in hand on the um, kind of unhealthy side of the ledger with exercise and if you just suspect a straight up eating disorder, there's a thing called the SCOF. And uh, this is um, just an acronym that stands for SICK, Control, One Stone. This is developed in the UK, so that's why One Stone, which is uh, about uh, 14 pounds. Uh, and then the F for fat and the F, second F for food. It's actually very sensitive in identifying an eating disorder. So really good thing if you think somebody is struggling. So these are just a couple tools that y'all can take away from the webinar and use in practice if you need help. So what I'll end on is we have to think about this by looking at the whole person. We can't look at just the behavior. We can't look at just their physical attributes. We can't look at any one thing. We have to think about everything. And really, when you get right down to it, movement is an expression. So there's a relational quality to that movement. How is movement or exercise impacting or being impacted by that relational quality? That's a really good way of kind of easily understanding when exercise is becoming a problem. So to wrap it up, what does a healthy relationship look like? You can't tell by the behavior itself. 
you have to look for psychological factors. Again, this doesn't mean looking into a crystal ball or becoming a psychologist or asking them about their dreams or childhood or anything like that. Rather, it means looking at things like motives and, and so forth that we've discussed in, in several of the questions and comments that came in on the chat have really exemplified. So uh, a, a real honest awareness and, and self-reflection is really where we have to go with this. Part of that is the ability to balance all aspects of life. And a big part of that is rest. Rest is part of any legitimate fitness program or exercise program. Try not to succumb to fad diets or workout plans or unsubstantiated health advice. It's weird because we kind of have a human tendency to kind of lean towards anecdotal evidence. You know, that it worked for me sort of testimony is very powerful. Um, we don't know what else that person had going or what else they were doing that they're not telling us. What else could be the causal factor there? So try to stay away from that and re-educate clients on the dangers of that kind of anecdotal type testimony. And remember, movement is something that should fuel and fulfill ourselves. It's not something that should drain us, or it's not something that we have this perverse pleasure in finding pain and emptiness and things like that. Um, so really kind of teasing apart these kind of motivations. And on that, I will um, end this by asking, uh, whoops, where's my thing right here? What else? Um, so that is a great point to jump off for a few minutes of discussion. Thank you so, so much. Thanks. Great, great information. Um, everybody feel free to unmute yourself. We would love for this to be an open conversation. Um, I am definitely big on looking at relationships to stuff like trackers and to stuff like, like Brian mentioned briefly, the workout plan situation. I think that that has a really easy tendency to slip into that all or nothing, gotta force it, gotta make it happen kind of mindset. Um, and the tracker can be really tricky too because you're looking at that as kind of like a number and you have to beat the last number or it doesn't count if you don't get to that point. Yeah. Um, I know that I see that a lot. So that's, that was something that I definitely struggled with personally and see a lot in clients. And I would love to hear other people's questions or other things that they feel like really have helped them kind of get to that moment of clarity. Yeah, I mean, that's an excellent point and unfortunately something that isn't going to go away anytime soon. I mean, we're all being tracked by Big Brother, right? I mean, our phones have accelerometers in them. Um, I, I used to do this when I would present at conferences and say, how many of you guys have a uh, accelerometer right now and of course uh, eating disorder conferences especially I'd get a grumble in the crowd and Sarah how many of you guys have a smartphone and they'd all raise their hand or show it I'm like yeah you have an accelerometer you're being tracked um, if you're on that continuum going towards the unhealthy way you're going to know that you're going to either I mean whether it's the one on your phone or you're going to buy a proprietary model that goes on your wrist or some other part of your body that's going to be it um, I can tell you I've published research on the validity of these things and they're all pretty terrible. Mm. They don't get what they say. Um, it's a thing where I think the, um, the community has made a deal with the devil and said, okay, well, if um, we have this um, problem with people being inactive, because we know that only one third of an Americans get a sufficient amount of activity, one third kind of are like weekend warriors, and one third don't do anything. Well, we want to get that other two thirds up to where the one third that's doing what they should do. So it's kind of made a, a deal with the devil in, in saying, well, then let's just track and see what we got. And more is better than some, uh, nothing. Right. So you take that and put that into that red box that we had, and you see where that becomes more grease on that slippery slope. Mm -hmm. um, and it is a very powerful external message that becomes internalized. And what I mean, mean by that is we all have belief in these things. Um, the classic example is um, how many steps are we supposed to get every day? And I'm mm -hmm. smiling as I say that because you know I'm setting you up. <laughs> I'm not going to answer because I know the answer. <laughs> but we'd all say 10,000, right? Yeah. The ubiquitous health advice is 10,000. Does anybody know where that number came from? Wasn't it like a person who studied stars or something like just maybe I haven't heard that one but <laughs> um, 
a couple published studies have found the origins of this, a group out of LSU um, and uh, recently a group out of Harvard actually have discussed this. Um, so I know it from that area, but it could very well be uh, in a more astrological based thing. Um, but the uh, company that in, uh, created the first pedometer was a Japanese company back in the 60s and named their pedometer, and I apologize if I'm butchering the Japanese pronunciation of this, but Manpo Kai, I believe is what it was named. And that name had connotation to the number 10. Um, uh, the number in, in Japanese culture is very important. And what they found when they put these pedometers on their um, their workers is that not many of them were actually walking 10,000 steps. So it just seemed like it fit and it just kind of literally grew legs and walked from there. Um, and we just never questioned it. Yet there's very little, if any, scientific evidence that 10,000 is actually important. And in fact, that study from Harvard that I just mentioned that came out about a year, year and a half ago, found that First off, we know that most people don't get anywhere near 10,000 steps, but you can be perfectly holistically healthy, physiologically, psychologically, and socially healthy at much less, even down to 4,000 steps. Mm -hmm. So this notion that there's this magical uh, number that you have to attain is just complete BS. Mm -hmm. uh, there's no evidence for that. For some people, you can get 10,000. For some people, you can get five, and it's perfectly fine. For some people, you can even get less. Um, so it's really not about any of that. And it's just something that we just commonly accept. I mean, there's so many things in pop culture that, that play out that way. And unfortunately, this one has had a pretty detrimental effect on the health and well-being, especially of individuals that are predisposed to either exercise or eating pathology. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Yeah, I think BMI, um, dad slash Tom just mentioned that <laughs> he was, I think BMI was the one that was an yes. astrologer. It was just like, it didn't even, or something like that. It was the person who created it literally had no scientific in that realm kind of background and just Absolutely. put it out there. Yep. Yeah. I mean, there's so many things wrong with BMI. I just, yeah. <laughs> I mean, whole nother webinar. <laughs> yeah, that's a whole nother webinar. <laughs> Let's just move on. <laughs> right. Yeah, right, Tom. I mean, BMI is another one where that number is um, maybe just slightly above useless. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> would definitely agree. Very cool. Well, yay! Thank you so so much, Brian. This thank was you. super yeah. awesome. So so. And thank pretty. you all for great questions and discussion and comments throughout. This has been phenomenal. Awesome. I, I, Good. Yay. Well, thank you. Thank you. And reminder, we will be uploading this to our Clarity Fitness YouTube page. So definitely feel free to check it out there. I am super excited again. Thank you, Brian, so much for coming and hanging out with us at Clarity Fitness. And we thank will you. definitely be hosting more webinars. Awesome. I look forward to it. Good. Yay. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Have a great Bye. one.